A Texas man has been convicted in the first criminal trial stemming from the January 6th attack. A jury found Guy Reffitt guilty on all charges related to the riot. He could now spend up to 60 years in prison when he's sentenced in June. Scott McFarlane has been following this case closely and has reaction to the verdict. It took the jury less than four hours to convict Guy Reffitt of Texas on five counts, including carrying a gun to the Capitol grounds, obstruction of Congress, and interfering with police. He now potentially faces up to 60 years in prison. For days, prosecutors showed jurors a series of videos and photos of Reffitt at the front of the mob on January 6, 2021, though he never made it inside the Capitol. His own son testified against Reffitt, saying he was so frightened by his father's anti-government rhetoric that he tipped off the FBI. And he pointed to messages in which Reffitt bragged after the riot. I felt so patriotic and felt like such an American than what we did. Reffitt didn't testify, and his lawyers didn't present any witnesses. One juror spoke with us after the verdict, asking we not reveal her identity. Did that matter to you at all that this man didn't take the stand and didn't present a defense? It, it did. It, it did. Um, the, the one time that we saw any emotion out of him was when his son took the stand. So yeah, it did. It mattered a lot. Prosecutors didn't just win this case. They potentially won new leverage over those still awaiting trial. There will be many defendants who have seen this verdict, saw how it was returned quickly, unanimously, the strength of the government's case, and they're going to seek a plea deal, and they're going to seek cooperation as part of that. After the verdict, Reffitt's wife told me she hopes other defendants are not scared into taking pleas. The reason that we have all guilty verdicts is they are making a point out of Guy. There's also a new high-profile January 6th defendant, Proud Boys leader Enrique Tario was arrested on Tuesday and appeared in a Miami court charged with conspiracy. He didn't take part in the riot, but prosecutors say he helped plan and direct the mob. Now, this trial could create a blueprint for the hundreds of other cases linked to the Capitol riot. Both the Justice Department and the January 6th House Committee are investigating. So Robert Costa is joining us now from uh, Capitol Hill to talk a little bit more about these investigations. And Robert, I want to start with this. What is the, the biggest difference uh, between the uh, committee investigation and the Justice Department investigation? Both of these probes have similar aims, but they have different approaches at this point based on our reporting. On Capitol Hill here, the House January 6th committee is focused right now on trying to piece together a possible criminal conspiracy on a legal and political level involving former President Donald Trump and his lawyers like John Eastman, who wrote that memo outlining how he could maybe try to push the election into the House of Representatives. And so far, the Department of Justice has been very focused in its prosecutions on the violence of the day of the insurrection. So at what speeds are both of these investigations moving? Uh, these investigations are moving along pretty quickly. You see the Department of Justice still has an ongoing grand jury investigation where it could go into areas the House Committee is also looking into. But we don't have full visibility into what the DOJ is doing beyond these prosecutions at the moment of Proud Boy members, of others who participated in the violence. We're really going to have to also wait to hear from the committee when it begins its hearings this spring and ultimately issues a report. And we know that the committee was pursuing uh, former President Trump's uh, attorney, John Eastman. What's the latest on that? John Eastman, a California lawyer, continues to litigate against the January 6th committee, along with Chapman, his university that he's affiliated with as a, as a lawyer and a professor. Uh, he's citing attorney-client privilege, executive privilege, that his conversations with the president, the former one, should be protected. Uh, and that's going to continue to, to make its way through both civil court and possibly even all the way up to the Supreme Court. That's how so many people on the Trump side see this. They're waiting to see ultimately what a higher court on the federal level or the Supreme Court might do when it comes to the question of executive privilege. Yeah, and, and Robert, as you know, the National Archives reportedly sent uh, to the House Committee a new batch of records requests from the Trump administration, uh, this with materials from former Vice President Mike Pence. So what are you hearing about the likelihood of the former Vice President cooperating with the panel's investigation? He has come out vocally to say that what happened on January 6th was, was wrong. He sort of has couched his language. It's not a full-throated, right. uh, you know, uh, suggestion that what happened was wrong. But, but, 
But he has broken away from the former president on that. So would he be willing to cooperate with the uh, the Canary Six Committee? After speaking to people close to the former vice president, it's it's clear he believes he's in a little bit of a murky legal situation, uh, constitutional situation. Does it make sense for a vice president to talk about confidential conversations, private conversations he had with the sitting president? In particular, the conversation Pence had with Trump on January 5th. 2021 in the Oval Office on the eve of what happened on January 6th. So far, people close to Vice President Pence have cooperated with the committee. We've seen Greg Jacob, Pence's lawyer, go into the committee to cooperate and chat. We've seen Mark Short, another lawyer, Pence's chief of staff, also go into the January 6th committee and share some information to have a conversation. Whether Pence himself sits down, whether under oath with his hand in the air or in a private deposition, is still something his lawyers are working out with the January 6th committee. But if, if not Pence, at least they'll maybe have some of these visitor logs that have been coming forward and the phone logs, which are so important for someone like former President Trump, who, who frequently uses the phone to try to get people to do what he wants. Uh, Robert, before you go, let me ask you uh, something related to what's happening uh, in Ukraine uh, with the Russian invasion. Um, what are you hearing from your sources, uh, Republican sources or other, on the the uh, what are they telling you about their support for former President Trump's phone call with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky that led to the impeachment? In other words, the president withholding vital, crucial support for Ukraine for political dirt on his political opponent. Many Republicans supported that perfect phone call, as former President Trump called it. I know Steve Scalise was asked about it recently. What else are you hearing? And Steve Scalise was indicative of how so many Republicans are responding to these questions. Shrugging it off, Scalise is in the House Republican leadership. He's saying President Trump was in the right. Didn't want to get into the, an in-depth discussion about Trump's conduct during that time in 2019. I covered that up close in 2019, the pressure campaign on Zelensky, on Ukraine, holding back some of this military funding. But so many Republicans, whether it's Trump's comments on Putin or Trump's comments in 2019 and his conduct with Ukraine, these are things they'd rather forget or recharacterize as they move forward because they believe they can just be on better political ground attacking President Biden. But facts are facts. These issues still linger. And that is exactly why we're talking about it, so that people don't forget. Robert, thank you very much, my friend, as always. Appreciate it. Thank you.